uh, really uh, impressed to see a full room here on the, the late shift. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have got flights and things this afternoon. So I did a talk at this time uh, last year and it wasn't quite so well attended. So this is a bit of a surprise. Um, so yeah, hello, I'm Charlie. I work at Styra on the developer relations team. Uh, I work closely with the OPA project. Um, and this is Rita. Uh, hey everyone, uh, my name is Rita. I am a uh, OPA gatekeeper maintainer, um, and I'm also a chair for Kubernetes SIG auth, as well as SRC. I'm very glad to have you guys here. Um, maybe just begin, before we begin, I would like to kind of pull the room to see how many folks are using OPA today. Awesome. <laughs> you don't care. <laughs> um, and then how many people are using OPA gatekeeper today? Awesome. Uh, and how many people are using conf test? Thank you. And how many people are using OPA outside of Kubernetes? Or perhaps for any other use case, microservice authorization, something like that. You, not many. Okay, thanks. Okay, so yeah, uh, quickly a little overview on the agenda. Um, brief overview and introduction to the Open Policy Agent um, project and, and tool. A couple of project updates and a little preview of some upcoming items on the roadmap. Um, and then, yeah, Rita's going to talk about a similar uh, set of topics for Gatekeeper. So what is Open Policy Agent? It's a CNCF project. It's a graduated CNCF project. Uh, you probably have heard about it, seeing as you're here, uh, but that's how it fits in. Um, I like to think of the Open Policy Agent uh, project and, and, and community as, as a collection of these things. So. What brings it all together is the Rego language, which is a domain-specific policy language uh, for, for writing uh, any, kind of, uh, any kind of policy requirement that you might have in your stack, whether that's Kubernetes admission or microservice authorization or you name it. As long as it's a policy decision, uh, it's, it's relevant for the Rego language. You bring that um, in combination with a policy server. A policy server is able to evaluate this Rego language and make policy decisions for you. Uh, in addition to reloading of policy uh, and logging of policy decisions. Couple that with some language SDKs. We have a native SDK for Go, which is how some of our community integrations are built, for example, Gatekeeper and ConfTest, uh, and a number of other SDKs based on WebAssembly for different programming languages. And you bring all of that together with some tooling and the community, and you get the OPA project. So this is how you might use OPA in, an author in a, distribution, a distributed system where you're using OPA as an uh, authorization server. You're providing some information to, to OPA in order to make a decision. OPA is loading in policy rules and perhaps some extra data uh, and just returning a de decision result. You can also use OPA within a single application via one of the SDKs where perhaps some part of the application is calling another part of the application, a module perhaps, um, which is using, um, using OPA within, within that application. So there's two different use cases are uh, fundamentally sort of how anybody who's using OPA is using it. So yeah, like I mentioned, it can be in an application that you've built um, and you're calling it via the REST API or using an SDK. It might be the Kubernetes API server that's calling your OPA or Gatekeeper instance and making an admission check or mutating some resources as they're landing in your cluster. Uh, it might be a CI CD run, which is making a check against some configuration that's about to be deployed, perhaps to a public cloud. Uh, perhaps it's some internal configuration file format instead. Um, or it might be another common in integration we have is with the Envoy proxy and the external authorization integration there. And we have a, a specific plugin related to that too. So yeah, um, based on some of the responses we had at the beginning, like most people might be somewhat familiar with the language already. This is a simple policy that I could write or I wrote in order to sort of briefly outline how Rego works. So we have a package here, a policy package, and it has a single rule defined, which is called allow. And it will only allow in the case that the information that's provided to the policy at evaluation time where the user's role is an admin. In all other cases, the default is evaluated um, and the result will be false. So how this might look in the server use case, you make a post request to an end, uh, one of the endpoints on the REST API on OPA server with some, with some data. The policy is evaluated as part of that request and the response is, in this case, a Boolean value true. 
One can imagine if the role were a different value or the role were missing, or uh, that would be a different response. So that's a little intro into OPA. A uh, quick overview on some things that have been going on in the community since the last KubeCon. We've, um, we've got, a, as part of our documentation, we have a list of integrations with the OPA project. OPA is a general purpose policy engine. We have high hopes for it to be used in all sorts of different places. Um, we've added 25 new integrations uh, since the last KubeCon in, in Detroit. Um, there's some fun graphs there to show you how the number of contributors across our projects are also increasing, and there are also more people using OPA as a library. And I think this is really exciting because it shows how people are, are trusting OPA or, trust, or are interested in using the language in more places um, beyond the, the existing tools that we have or the server use case. Uh, we also have six new public corporate adopters on the uh, adopters page. If you're using OPA and you're not in the adopters file, uh, please open a pull request and uh, get your name on there too. Um, you can add a little link to your website and what, how you're using OPA. It's really, um, we don't get a lot of signal back sometimes, so even little bits like that in the adopters file are really interesting to see. Um, and we've also got loads of people using Slack. Uh, the QR code at the bottom of the screen, that'll take you to sign up to Slack. We spend a lot of time there. Rita spends a lot of time there as well. We've got a gatekeeper channel for queries related to gatekeeper. Um, some of my star colleagues uh, are regularly answering questions. So yeah, we spend a lot of time there. So if you're having any trouble, please do um, come by the Slack. So yeah, um, we're releasing the open policy agent um, around about once a month, and we've had six releases since the last KubeCon. Obviously, the dot fifty release is a is a is a big release for us. Uh, so it feels like a milestone. So we're very happy about that. And yeah, going forward, we're continuing to release around about once a month. Um, a brief public service announcement: uh, We used to push these rootless tagged images. Um, quick show of hands: Does anybody know if they're using the rootless flavor of the OPA images? One hand. So this guy, uh, um, please, uh, if you could update, bear in mind going forward, everything is rootless now. If you want to use root, you should configure your container to run using root via different means. Uh, all of the images are now rootless. So um, yeah, a few quick project updates. Uh, we've merged over 250 pull requests since the last KubeCon. Uh, we've, as most of the things that we've added are related to the language, and I'm going to dig into two of those in detail. Um, they, we've, we've added these functions for validating of JSON schemas or objects against JSON schemas. Um, we've got objects.keys, which allows you to get the, the keys from a key value object. We've added some uh, way of formatting time, uh, the GraphQL schema valid function as well, and uh, the net side is valid. So various validation things. But I'm going to dig into the JSON schema verification uh, briefly after this. Uh, I think that's one of the most exciting ones. Uh, we've also added what we call refs in rule heads, uh, which doesn't really make much sense there, but I'll try and show why that's interesting as well in a moment. In addition to language-related features, we've, uh, we have support for the AWS Signature uh, API, uh, or Signature, sorry, Signature Request Signing API. Um, so that's another um, new function, for, which is useful if you're loading, uh, loading bundles over uh, for, over the bundle service ABI from S3 or something. Um, we have a new way of um, defining which decisions are logged based on policy. We've added some shorthands to run OPA with uh, an example or, or a remote bundle to make examples to, uh, of using example bundles easier. Uh, various monitoring, monitoring related updates around logging of unauthorized, re unauthorized requests against the API. Um, and various other performance improvements under the hood. So uh, yeah, I'd like to see who's paying attention or see who's listening. I don't know if anybody can point out the mistake that uh, is presented here in this policy. So we have a policy which is trying to block input where someone is using an example.com email address. Um, does anybody spot the problem here on the slide? I think you were first or you were the first one I saw. Exactly, yes, there's an S missing. So like, and this I think is, uh, is a good um, example to, and this, I've created this example specifically to show how the JSON schema validation works. So um, the idea here is that I've got an example.com email address and I'm providing some information about a new contact. 
And I've, got, I've written a policy which I'm hoping would stop uh, this request from coming through. But if I click Evaluate, you see that it's actually been allowed. And allow is set to true if the deny set is empty. Um, and the reason is, as our friend here pointed out, that I'm, point, I'm providing contact. And my policy is written expecting contacts. So if I try and delete some of this, uh, here's one I prepared earlier. Um, so now I'm going to instead, uh, I'm going to add a new deny rule, and I'm going to make sure that the input that I provide match is a schema. Um, and this, the schema provides some of the sort of information you might expect, but crucially it requires some of these top level keys, which includes contacts. Um, and so now when I evaluate my policy, uh, we should see that allow is false. And also I've got a new error message back saying, that uh, contacts is required at the root of the object that I was um, <coughs> supplying. So I don't know how to get, quite get back to this, but I'm going to go back this way. Yeah, maybe I'll try that one next time. Um, I actually don't have any other demos, so I'll be safe, I think. Um, so yeah, that's, the, that's how the, the JSON schema uh, validation works. I encourage you to go and check out those new built-in functions. Um, refs and rule heads. Uh, it's uh, not a particularly catchy name. This is, this is the name of the issue, and this is the name that we've gone with when we're talking about it. Um, we, you often you might want to define policy in this way, where the input method, for example, this is a good example, I think, to highlight it. So where the input method might be get or post against a particular resource, uh, and to use the, the information from the context of the request to dig down into different policies. Um, so. In days gone by, you needed to do this. You would create a package um, with, I think there's actually an error, might be a slight error in these examples. I'm not sure those curly braces on the first lines are meant to be there. But uh, you would have you would have to define packages in separate files where you'd have rules.get.pets to define the get policy, rules.delete.pets in a separate file to define the delete policy. It's now possible to, to, do, uh, to provide all of that policy in, in one file. So you can use these, and that's what it's called well, refs and rule heads or dots and rule heads, uh, you can see how that fits together. Um, just briefly, um, have a quick dip into some of the items on the roadmap. Uh, I think one that's, that's fun is the ellipsis operator. Uh, so the idea here is that um, we'd be able to do, instead of doing matching on specific key uh, or indexes within a list or within an object, we can say, does it match in this way? And then it's kind of, I don't care about the rest of the list. Um, is the is the idea. So that's that's one thing which is which is on the roadmap and coming quite soon. Um, I've talked a bit about schema validation already, but something that we're planning to do is to allow um, you to validate the input that's provided uh, without needing to use the built-in functions. So to annotate a given rule and say the input must conform with this schema for for this rule. Uh, and that, what's exciting about that is you don't need to. So in my example previously, you saw I added a new rule which validated it against the schema. Um, now, uh, with this change, it would be possible to just annotate rules and say, this rule is related to this, and it requires this schema, um, and it saves you from doing, bringing in all those extra rules. So that's upcoming. Um, and I don't know who here is using OPA test or who's actually testing their policies. I don't know whether... There are a few people who test the policies. That's a relief. Um, so yeah, there's um, anybody who has used it may be familiar with the slightly challenging output um, that you get from running OPA test. Anyway, the idea here is that we're we're going to be able to provide a more user-friendly way uh, of presenting the output from from tests and showing how that um, exactly what went wrong. Okay, so um, that's all I had on the on the core OPA part. Now I'm going to hand over to Rita, who's going to talk about um, how you use this in Kubernetes and how the Gatekeeper project works and what the latest news is. We are at KubeCon after all. Indeed, indeed. All right. Um, so for those of you who are already familiar with OPA, you're probably using it in your organization. Uh, and you may have uh, users or your customers may be asking, well, how do I use OPA with my Kubernetes clusters? Right? How do I make sure... Uh, the workloads that are deployed to my Kubernetes clusters are compliant to uh, governance as well as maybe company policies, right? So that's where the uh, Gatekeeper project comes in. 
Um, so it is a customizable Kubernetes emission webhook. Um, it actually uses OPA uh, engine uh, in, uh, embedded into the gatekeeper as part of the webhook. Uh, and it is used to enforce policies and enhance governance in your organizations. Um, and as uh, Charlie just mentioned, uh, sometimes actually you might be using uh, OPA gatekeeper under the hood. Maybe you're not, you don't even know that you're using it. Uh, I know uh, Google uh, Anthos actually has Gatekeeper embedded in their policy engine, um, and, and Microsoft Azure also has uh, this as part of their Azure policy feature. So what does that mean? What does it look like, right? And why do we even create this project in the first place? Um, for those of you who uh, actually built your own emission webhook, you probably know how hard that is, right? Anytime that you need to um, make a change, you would need to recompile and deploy to the cluster. So the whole concept behind Gatekeeper is uh, its policy uh, as configurations, right? So it, essentially you have different personas in the company where the people who write the policies may need to know Rego, but the people who are operating the clusters and enforcing the policies may not even care about the actual policies, right? They just want need to make sure that the, the cluster is secure and the workloads are secure, right? So that's the, the gist of uh, uh, the gatekeeper motivation, right? Is to control what the end users can do on the cluster, but the users don't need to write a single line of Go code. Uh, and again, uh, many large companies, uh, you know, want to make sure their clusters are conformant to some company policy. Uh, and uh, also, uh, and many companies, including uh, you know Microsoft, right? How do you actually push out policies in the organization? Uh, without impacting your production workloads, right? Let's say you're trying to enforce some policy and introduce them in your company. The way you want to do it is slowly roll them out, right? And one way to do that is by introducing these po policies across your clusters uh, in, in a phase, in different phases, uh, so that you can ensure you can actually audit and, and make sure the policies are secure uh, and make sure people are addressing these issues before you start enforcing them, and i.e. not break down your workload, and, and your on-calls will have to get the call in the middle of the night. Um, so yeah, so how do I actually do this uh, without sacrificing developer agility? Uh, again, policy is code, uh, and Gatekeeper is a validating emission webhook, as well as mutating. Um, so you can use uh, Gatekeeper to enforce uh, these policies as well as mutating so that um, people to, so that you can ensure that when things are deployed to the cluster they're actually deployed with company policy uh, whether that's updating the deployment YAML or adding some labels or annotations uh, and also it comes with audit so there are times where maybe you don't want to uh, strictly deny deployment right on the cluster so you you might want to see, I wonder how many people are running, I don't know, with uh, containers that are pulled from Docker Hub as opposed to my company's registry, right? So how do I actually get a compliance report of what is actually running in the clusters? Uh, Gatekeeper, it provides that audit capability. Uh, and also, what if you have, uh, instead of catching problems at deployment time and even runtime, right? How do you make sure that your developers are doing the right things? Um, so in Gatekeeper Project, we also have a Gator CLI. So the idea is you use the exact same policy that you're enforcing in your production clusters, but you're putting them as part of your CI CD. So you can break build, right? So you can catch the problem at the source. Uh, so your developers are intentionally deploying the right things to their clusters. Uh, and last but not least, we also have now have the, uh, the external data feature. Uh, we heard from a lot of customers and users who are saying, you know what, I love enforcing things in Kubernetes with Kubernetes resources, but what if I have things in my policies that reaches things outside of the cluster, right? Say if you have, um, say if you want to check if your container images are signed, right? Uh, or if they're um, using, um, let's say, owner uh, labels, right? You might want to use the uh, users' uh, LDAP uh, properties, right? How would you actually be able to pull that external data from outside of the cluster? So external data allows you to do that. 
uh, and, sorry, last but not least, uh, we also have the community policy library. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot of companies already, you know, uh, run this as a managed feature as part of their um, offering. Um, so a lot of companies already wrote a bunch of really great regos, uh, and so they all basically donated them as a, a, a community policy library. So. It, uh, instead of you having to figure out how to write those regos, chances are they already exist in this policy library. Uh, here's the, uh, just kind of give you an example. Um, here's an example of a, li uh, a policy in the community policy library. Um, and as you can see, he, this is one uh, policy that someone actually contributed based on the ACV. Uh, it, to enforce external IPs. Um, it's a man in a middle attack um, by ensuring load balancers are not using external IPs. Uh, and this is a project update. Um, so since the last KubeCon, we've had two releases. Uh, so the current release is V312. Um, so what are the updates that we introduced? Well, uh, external data is now beta, um, and we've ensured now TLS and MTLS is enforced. It's required to communicate between gatekeeper and the external data providers. Uh, and Gator CLI is now beta. Uh, now it provides a lot of capabilities that, again, you can add to your CI-CD pipeline. Uh, and then there is a new assigned image mutator. Um, so uh, again, I'll go into depth uh, on the following two. Uh, and we've added multi-engine support. Um, how many of you guys already heard of uh, the Kubernetes validating emission policy? And are you here to wonder like how does this, how is it gonna work with Gatekeeper? Uh, so we'll be talking about that. So multi-engine support was added so that we can integrate the two. Uh, and also, uh, emit violation events. Um, this feature was added a, a long time ago, um, but uh, in 3.12, now you're able to get the events generated in the namespace that the violating object is in. Uh, and then now we, you can also exempt namespace with a suffix uh, in addition to prefix. Uh, and then also uh, the Expended resources now have generated mock names. So when you see the violation, you actually can see the names of the generator resources. Uh, and let's say you have annotations on your policies, you can now see them in the logs. All right, uh, so I talked about assigned image earlier. Um, so here is an example of how you can mutate uh, a, a resource that you're deploying to your Kubernetes cluster. Um, I, I know, uh, I don't know how many of y'all had to deal with the recent switch for Kubernetes images, you know, going from the old registry to the new registry. Um, but let's say in your company, you have people who are pulling from Docker Hub and you have a mirror in the company and you wanna make sure when people deploy their container images, they're actually pulling from your image, uh, your registry and not Docker Hub. Here's one way to do it, right? Um, so you deploy this to your cluster and you say, hey, for all pots, um, for all the images, I want you to replace the registry with my company's registry. And by doing this, once again, you're ensuring that people are not just pulling from random Docker Hub uh, 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 repos. Um, all right, so let's talk about multi-engine support. Um, in 126, uh, Kubernetes 126, uh, an alpha feature called validating a mission policy was introduced. Uh, it basically is a declarative and in-process way of validating um, policies if, against your emission request. Uh, so you might ask, well, that sounds a lot like Gatekeeper, right? And it does, right? Um, so, so the motivation for this is to help us understand when to use what and what's the differentiation between the two. Um, so. First off, validating a mission policy is a entry native policy. So it doesn't require the extra hop that a typical emission webhook requires. Uh, the, the benefit of that is it reduces the request latency, right? Uh, and because it doesn't require the extra hop, you now have more reliability and availability. And because of that, you can actually uh, fail close, right? So one of the key issues with any uh, emission webhooks, 
right, is because you're requiring an extra hop. And if that hop is not available, in, in fact, you're actually impacting the request. And therefore, a lot of webhooks actually fail open. Um, so, if in, so for policies, this is a big problem, right? You want to make sure you're enforcing the policies, but at the same time, you don't want the cluster to have availability issues. Um, so with this, you can now actually fail close uh, without worrying about availability. Uh, and again, operation burn is reduced because you don't have to worry about maintaining another webhook. Uh, and the language uh, that's embedded is cell. It's, a, a, it's actually a, uh, I think Google started cell. Um, and now let's look at a gatekeeper. You might ask, well, like, wow, this sounds really great. So when do I, what, what are the scenarios where I actually need to use gatekeeper? Um, well, Gatekeeper provides the audit functionality, which validating emission policy does not. Um, in theory, you could go to your API server and look at the logs, um, but audit, Gatekeeper audit would just basically have all this uh, violation as part of Gatekeeper audit. And again, it's if you have uh, integrations with audit, chances are you could create audit reports and compliance reports for, for, for the cluster operator, right? Uh, and another one is referential policies, right? What do I mean by referential policies? Well, let's say you have a policy that needs to check for ingress hostname uniqueness, right? Uniqueness, uniqueness requires you to look at the incoming requests and compare against everything that already exists in the cluster. And that's what I mean by referential policy. And that is something validating a mission policy cannot do, right? Uh, again, external data. Chances are you have some data source that's outside of the cluster. Uh, validating emission policy is very much everything in the cluster. Um, so this, uh, again, gives you extra capability if you need it. Uh, mutation. Uh, Gatekeeper, again, helps you mutate in addition to validating. And shift left, right? The same policy you, you need. Now you, with Gatekeeper, you can use the same policy, uh, but within your CI CD uh, with the Gator, Gator CLI. Uh, and also, because OPA is very, very powerful, um, you are able to write very complex rules that cell simply cannot, right? Um, and once again, there are a bunch of community policy libraries that's already out there, so chances are you could just literally pop it and deploy it in your cluster. You don't even have to write a single, uh, you don't need to write a new policy. Uh, and Gatekeeper, uh, you know, because we add a multi-engine, the idea is that it supports OPA and more. Right, uh, and then again, which means you get to uh, write your policy in Rego, in Cell, in whatever language that your users are comfortable with. Now you may ask, well, that's that's cool. We get the best of both worlds, but uh, sorry, that's cool. The, they both do different things, but how do I make sure I get the best of both worlds? Is there even a way? Um, yes, and that's this multi-engine support concept that we're working on. Um, so. Today, Gatekeeper is dependent on this framework called Constraint Framework as part of the op Open Policy Engine org. Um, so the idea is that we can create an abstraction layer, right, that simplifies the user experience, allow the users to actually uh, write the policy in whatever language they're familiar with, but the operator that are deploying these policies are basically deploying them in the same, uh, same manner. So again, the concept is, Multi-language, multi-target policy enforcement, Rego cell together, targeting Kubernetes emissions, Terraform, or whatever target that you need, uh, and portable policies, right? Same policy, you can use it in CI, CD, in whatever uh, enforcement mechanism. And uh, furthermore, you can actually, um, uh, this is already in Gatekeeper, so it's, so this is why we're adding it um, and enabling multiple engines, right? So again, use the best part of uh, the different engines that are in uh, that are currently in the community. Uh, and what we believe how this can help is because Gatekeeper and OPA are way more mature than the entry validating emission policy, which is still alpha. Uh, the idea is that we bridge the gap and together with Gatekeeper and Gator CLI, you're able to also get audit and shift left validations for the new validating emission uh, policy for free, right? 
Uh, so yeah, so just an example, we're adding validating a mission policy based on cell uh, to constraint framework. Um, and someone in the community also asked for Starlog support. Um, so what does that even look like, right? Just to kind of give you an, a graphic understanding. So let's say you have an emission request when it comes in, right? It goes to the API server. Uh, and, and the API server is just gonna go through all the emission controllers in addition to all the custom webhooks, right? So it's gonna go and look at all the uh, resources in the cluster. You got the validating emission policy uh, and then the binding and then uh, based on the binding, uh, the policies will basically run, right? Um, so an example would be require owner's label on everything. And then you have, uh, similarly, you have the mission webhooks like Gatekeeper, and the query will basically go to OPA, uh, and then OPA will look at all the constraints and constraint templates in the cluster, and then returns uh, basically the, the decision back to the API server, right? Uh, an example of that would be unique ingress host name. Um, so again, the future that we're envisioning is Gatekeeper could be the front end for all the Kubernetes policies where everything could be defined as constraints and constraint templates. And then the Gatekeeper controller will, when it sees like, hey, the engine is Kubernetes native validation, what that translates to is validating a mission policy binding and uh, validating emission policy uh, resources in the cluster. Uh, and again, when we talk about audit, you know, Gatekeeper will continue to be the audit engine uh, and depending on uh, which engine the constraint template is using, if it's using OPA Rego, it's gonna call the OPA driver. If it's using uh, Kubernetes native validation, it's gonna call the Kubernetes native validation driver. Right, so same front end, but talking to different engines within Gatekeeper, uh, and it's all seamless to the, the user, right? The users don't care. Well, all, all they care about is the language itself. Uh, so yeah, so what's next? Um, we wanna adopt Kubernetes native validation policies with minimal change uh, and bring it to audit shift left and then update the Gatekeeper library to now support Kubernetes native validation policies uh, support the base, uh, support these new policies for older Kubernetes policies, uh, Kubernetes versions, right? So what if you got customers that want to use it before 126? How do they even do it? Well, with Gatekeeper now you can't, right? Um, and Gator support, you know, for uh, Kubernetes native validation based rules. So now they can actually use it in their CI CD. And of course, more engines, right? Tomorrow there's probably going to be some other engine. and as a company, you probably don't want to have to, you know, deal with it every single time in a different manner. So that's pretty much all the uh, updates. And I just want to say thank you to all the contributors for everything you've uh, helped with the last few releases. Yeah, thank you.